Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Sorry for the technical uh, misconfiguration, but welcome to Albert's List Jobs Report of July 2023. Joining us will be Dr. Riley White, as usual, from the University of New Mexico. Today, we're going to cover the uh, core uh, inflation numbers, uh, the job numbers, the debt numbers, and all other comings and goings of the economy. As usual, this will be recorded and put on YouTube within seven business days. And if you have any questions, please drop them into the chat and we will try and address them. On to you, Dr. White. Thanks so much, Colin. It is a pleasure to see everybody here today. Keep rocking. It is so good to see Aaron here. It's so good to see Sean here. It's so good to see some of our um, our uh, uh, people who have been here before in the audience. This is your first time. I'm so sorry. Uh, we're so happy you're able to make it here today. And remember, ask questions, ask whatever comes to your mind. I'll get back to them. Chat window is usually the best way to do it. Uh, I keep monitoring that pretty consistently throughout this chat. And today we're going to rock and roll. We've got stuff to talk about today. And keep me posted with questions because all of your questions are always excellent and they're good. We're going to dive down a little bit into the Bay Area, then go up and look at some aggregates in general. So there's some things going on, a lot of news. You're hearing a lot of things at once. Things are good, things are less good. Let's talk about what some of this means as it pertains to the economy right now and where we're going from here. And this is, I'm drafting some theses into this. I got a couple of talks lined up in September uh, for um, uh, uh, one of our, our big mortgage financing authority locally, our Bankers Association uh, for their annual meeting. And uh, I got to have some answers prepared. So feel free to ask whatever you like. All right. July 2023. But wait, it's August. But wait. Yeah, July is the most recent data we have. Here's our jobs report. So right now, some quick notes off the top. We added about 187,000 jobs in July. That is less than we anticipated and comes off of two negative revisions, meaning that we actually had 24,000 fewer jobs in June and 25,000 fewer jobs in May, not as robust as originally thought. However, where does 187,000 extra jobs fit into the scheme of things economically? It's a pretty good jobs report, pretty, pretty good in a Larry David sense. Uh, unemployment remains fairly steady at three and a half percent. This is very close to what we would call full employment. Um, and unemployment refers to the number of people who are unemployed relative to the number of people in the labor force who either are, are, are working or looking for a job if they are unemployed. If you drop out of the labor force, you're not included in that number. 63,000 jobs went to healthcare. The biggest interesting part about this, and you can see this in the chart here, for those of you sitting in the cheap seats, maybe on a phone, maybe on a tiny monitor, maybe on like, you're watching this on your watch, something else happened, you know, uh, education and health services are up 100,000. Of that, the majority is in healthcare. Healthcare is interestingly robust. If we track the sector over time, it does pretty well in bad times, and it's been doing increasingly well in good times. We've got a demographic headwind of aging baby, baby, baby boomers. We We've got just um, a incredible uh, a demand for healthcare related expenditures that have continued after the pandemic. And so this stuff has been flying along the board. We also have some positive news. Things like construction was up 19,000. That's good, especially as we wind down towards fall. Some of this is gear up towards infrastructure. Some of this is other stuff across the country. Uh, but overall, showing people building stuff is important. And we're going to get into that when we talk about real estate in particular, because some of that added construction is contributing to what is a kind of new housing boom, but not really when we look at the aggregate amount of data involved. Better than before is really the real answer. We added some leisure and hospitality, obviously a depressed sector from since the, since the pandemic days. Retail services are also up. Good news, good news, good news. But what's bad? Utilities, flat. That's okay. Manufacturing down about 2,000 jobs. Across the country, information sector hit the hardest down 12,000 jobs and near and dear to the heart of everyone here at Albert's List. So it's a very interesting thing when we think about this, this job market uh, right now. Participation rate remains fairly steady. It's good. It's about as good as it's going to get in this cycle, about 62.6%. Average hourly earnings. This is an encouraging number from wages. 
uh, increased about 14 cents. That, if we annualize that, take that 3374, divide it by 3360 to the power of 12, we get about 5.1%. Looking back the last 12 months, that's about 4.4%. That's a pretty solid wage growth. Interestingly, wage growth at this level, wage growth powers long-term inflation. And so the Fed gets a little bit wary about wage growth. They say, oh yes, wage growth is very good as long as it exceeds inflation, which currently right now it is for the last couple months, which has been great. But on the long story, when you look at sort of that, that long end, it is one of those driving factors that forces a lot of um, or can contribute to long-term inflation. And one of the reasons when the Fed looks at wage growth, they'll look at it with the, uh, with the discriminating eye of an economist and they'll say, my goodness, we can't have this because it means that inflation will also rise. How do you make inflation rise? You make stuff more expensive. People have to be paid more. It becomes a cycle. So it is interesting. And because of some of this data, we'll get into inflation. It suggests that we might be uh, in for higher rates for longer periods of time. So overall, a mixed bag, not as good as it was. This typically falls at 200,000. Uh, job report is pretty good uh, in good times, as I mentioned, but it's not... I mean, it's normal and, and it is part, it is coming off of what is historically this very long trend downward over the last uh, couple of years where we we had this big imp impetus of, um, of 5 trillion in stimulus spending that led to an increase in uh, saturation of jobs in certain sectors. Since then, it's kind of, it's fizzling. It's fizzling gradually out. Sean says, given that rates are high, utilities being flat for job growth makes sense. Uh, they tend to be conservative when rates are high. Absolutely. They need to pay higher dividends to attract capital in higher rate environments. Utilities are tricky things, right? Utilities are one of the more regulated industries because they can't operate in a free market. There's no way anybody could have uh, a situation, especially in, at least when we think of utilities in terms of, say, power or water infrastructure. I can't run 24 different water pipes under my house. So as a consequence, what happens is utilities become de facto monopolies over the areas they control. I mean, there's been a few cases. You remember places in West Texas had a couple of competing utilities, wires everywhere. You know, you have, all these, <laughs> it's a shocking experience. But then on the other side of it, it, become very, it becomes very difficult to maintain. Utilities are often refuges, uh, ref, a source of refuge, I should say, for investors in uh, recessionary times because a lot of the times their cash flows remain steady. And that's, re that's kind of a reason a lot of people enjoy it in the market. Uh, people tend to pay their electricity bills when they can afford to pay them. Aaron points out retail earnings were crushed this week. Oh, this is such an important topic, Aaron. Expect retail hiring to, to develop. I agree. Um, and I think that when we look at some of the retail earnings in general, people have been push, 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 spend, spend, spend. Consumer spending represents roughly two-thirds of our GDP, if I make that in aggregate, around 67%, um, which means that it's such a big portion of our, of our, of our, of our economy that uh, uh, building consumer spending, like we did in the post-pandemic recession era, uh, was able to accelerate our economy rapidly in itself. But also at the same time, you know, when it starts lagging or when people start spending less, and we're going to get into why people might be spending less um, in the coming um, in the coming slides, but it's a very very interesting dynamic. And so right here overall, we're seeing this sort of sort of trend where we're going downhill. Likewise, you look at GDP numbers. There's been talk, oh maybe GDP third quarter might hit three percent, four percent. I had one bank say five percent GDP growth annualized. That would be really good. But when we look at that increase in economic growth, what does that mean at the end of the day? So if we look at, say, real GDP, which is the GDP growth minus inflation, as opposed to, say, uh, GDP, which is um, nominal GDP, which is the actual numerical growth, nominal GDP has been kind of going down fairly steadily. And we expect that this slowing is going to continue. So what we're experiencing right now, or what you're feeling, in addition to your source of ennui, sitting at your job, wondering when the next Albert's List presentation is going to be. These are the times that, that, that we're looking at where we're looking at a series, a period, an extended period or extended slowdown that we expect to happen in the short run. Now, here's the thing here. How are things for consumers? How are you feeling? Are you feeling okay? Aaron, are you doing all right? Aaron says, given home buying is the largest consumer driver of durable goods expansion, but um, bum bum, and retail was keeping spending alive, now it's downhill. Kevin Costner and breaking away. Ooh, whipping out the Kevin Costner breaking away references. That's two points for Aaron. So that's pretty good. One point, two points for Sean too, for participating. This is good. Keep asking questions. I love, I love these questions. Keep, I love these inputs, not questions, but I love the aside too. 
So that's right too. So you look at home buying as a consumer benefit. One other aspect of home buying to think about is that uh, when equity when equity is high, when people have a lot of equity on their homes and they feel good about it, we can, we have research that shows they actually are more likely to spend more money, meaning they spend money because they feel confident in spending money. And right now, because real estate prices remain high, for those of you who are fortunate enough to own homes or in other capacities, you're in a position where those high prices can benefit your bottom spending, and you end up being more confident in spending. And so there's a feedback loop, as Aaron points out in the economy, where uh, you know home buying is very important. Now, as home buying has leveled off, equity prices have still remained high. And if equity prices start dropping, consumer sentiment is likely to drop along with it. Now, we know it's been dropping unevenly. Part of that's been driven by historically low inventories. And we'll talk about real estate in a second. I am getting ahead of myself. So shenanigans, delinquencies. What do we know about them? Do we care about them? Are they high? Are they low? They feel higher than they were. Am I delinquent? Are you delinquent right now? No, don't worry. The percent of U.S. consumer balances moving from current to 30 days plus delinquent during the quarter. So here we're looking at the physical shift. I'm ahead. I'm paying my bills to people who are physically more than 30 days delinquent a warning sign that there might be issues in the economy. So right at right at the pandemic, we saw this drop. We were flush with cash. We had direct expenses, people being paid money uh, 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 through um, the stimulus packages, through the other things organized by the government. A lot of state and local governments contributed as well. We had a drop in delinquency that happened during the pandemic. Since then, delinquency has been consistently on the rise, not only due to higher interest rates for things like automotive loans, which have reached all-time highs in the average amount of payment that we're looking at, but credit card debt as well, which is also near an all-time high, and mortgages and student loans, in terms of the amount of debt, I should say, not the actual delinquency of that debt. So right now, the good news is we're not in a catastrophic situation. Mortgage delinquencies are low. Student loan delinquencies are low. Credit card delinquencies are back and automotive delinquencies are back to where we were over a very stable period from about 2010 to about 2020. However, the, our, uh, the trajectory is important to watch. I see nothing allowing that these, uh, the in the next few months. I don't think we'll reach some stasis. Because interest rates are so high and because credit card debt is so significant, we're talking an average of $6,000 per person right now for credit card debt, which is if you take the total aggregate debt of $1 trillion and divide it by the working age adults, that's a sizable number that will be difficult to keep, particularly since um, uh, that credit card debt held by an average consumer. And so that's something to watch here. And this is a very important thing. So although in average delinquencies are low, they are rising and that trajectory will put us neatly above our delinquency rate before the pandemic in a very short amount of time, like three to seven months. And so it's gonna be an interesting thing if this pans out. Now, a life and debt situation, what do you do? So a couple of ways that we can look at debt loads. Are people under more debt than before? Now let's think, the biggest single piece of household debt in terms of our service of household debt for our, our, a household, if you're one of the 67% of people nationally, 50% or so of people who live in the city of San Francisco who own their own home, that is the single biggest piece of debt you have. It's the single biggest check that you write if you're dealing with debt. And because mortgage rates are still generally on average, mortgages that are held by individuals, not new mortgages being initiated. We know that uh, mortgage rates have skyrocketed from 2.65% to 7.04%, uh, but 7.09% in the last year and at two years uh, since January 2021. And that means that your average payment on a mortgage of a new house has increased 67% during that same period. That's a huge amount of money. Uh, the average homeowner maintains a very low interest rate mortgage, meaning that they're sitting on that 3%, 4%, 5% mortgage, 2.5% uh, mortgage that they can claw from their cold, dead hands, which is how I feel about the real estate market now. But the household debt payments as a percentage of personal income are still pretty low. This is the Fred chart at left. They were higher up leading up to the 2008 financial crisis because 
mortgages were expensive. People had um, adjustable rate mortgages that shot a hole completely through the market. And then, uh, and then since that time, people have delevered off of housing balances. But that doesn't mean that people are out of the woods. So instead of looking at that really big, big household mortgage and then comparing it to something else like a... Um, Oh gosh, like a credit card debt or your student loan debt, which is coming online. You're going to have a lot of very stressed out consumers in the next few months. And that's why I'm a little bit less optimistic than some of the folks out there that are saying, oh, we're going to have great economic growth in the next few months. And it's going to be sunshine, rainbows, unicorns. And I had a meeting with uh, a wealth manager who's like, yeah, it'll be growth now for the next 10 years. And I'm, I'm not that confident. I still think a recession is still perhaps on the horizon. Um, and, and we've been very good at delaying it. And there's very good reason to suggest that we might be delayed on it. So as, as Aaron, Ray, Aaron says, uh, Aaron Reyes says, uh, breaking away, so important. So household debt balance, what does it look like if you're talking debt in the household? Because this is important. So we know in aggregate, things that don't involve mortgages have been going up quite a bit. Another way to look at this, pretty consistently, in fact, since 2004, but particularly fairly recently. Right now, we're sitting on about $1.6 trillion of loan debt. And as the professor and associate dean, I'm part of the problem. I am the problem. I'm a walking problem. I have a shirt that says problem. And I walk through the, the, the hallowed corridors at the University of New Mexico with that on. But then there's credit card debt, which is now above a trillion dollars. Uh, there's automotive loan debt, which is now $1.6 trillion. That's an impressive increase. And considering that automotive loan rates are very prone to those interest rate variations and that automotive loan payments, if your car breaks, if it dies, you're going to need to buy another one. And that puts us at the mercy of other things. And I'm sitting there with my with my, my automobile with 200,000 miles on it, just praying it won't break. So I have some unnecessary expense followed by a egregiously priced loan. So you have all of this put together and you have a recipe for consumer uncertainty. And because all of these things exist, and even though wages are increasing, and that's a very favorable thing, I do have some concerns about how the debt market's going to play out in the next few years. I think um, bank exposure is going to be increasingly important as we look to the next five years to certain markets, especially consumer debt. If we see uh, meaningful upticks in things like automotive loan debt and, and also um, delinquency rates in credit cards, you're going to start seeing some consequences in the system and the way that these banks are operating. And and so this is a very important market to watch, where right now we are each month getting slightly unhealthier, <laughs> but we're not in a recession. And people are like, but wait, <laughs> you said there'd be a recession. I said there was a likelihood of a recession. But the thing is, we've been very good at putting this off, but I'm not, we're not out of the woods yet. And I think, you know, it could be next year, it could be 2026, but we will have to deal with some, I need to see some different numbers here to suggest that we're moving in a positive direction. What do you guys think? Questions or comments so far? Anything on board? Colin, Albert, anyone on the internet? Mm. That's exactly right, Albert. It's like a bad diet, Albert says. So yes, you won't do it. You can live every day. You take in 80, you know, what is it? Uh, I come to work each day, bring my, my tote bag of 30 sticks of butter and eat it in front of my coworkers. You know, it doesn't bother me the first day. I'm an amusing Sarge Sideshow act. But trust me, by that 25th day, you're going to feel it. <laughs> Hopefully you're still at Colin, what do you have too? Um, hmm. How much is the debt balance affected by raising rates? Good question. So I would say, so balance versus payment structure. We know obviously payment... Payments go up in accordance with rising rates. So credit card debt will rise in accordance with rates rising. We know automotive loan debt in the sense that, you know, people look at fairly short terms as opposed to the housing market of 30 years uh, for a fixed rate or 15 years for a fixed rate. People look at automotive loans in the terms of four, five, six, seven years. And so that makes it more prone to it. And so rising rates have caused the initiation of that debt to be more expensive, those payments to be higher. And the question is though, but that's a really interesting question. What's really driving this? You have products are getting more expensive. Inflation is getting more expensive. You have consumers trying to keep up spending habits in response to inflationary environment. And imagine, think of yourself. How have you altered your, um, your, your expenditures in the sense of the last couple of years while inflation has been happening? Colin and I were chatting earlier about the increase we've seen in, say, the price of even getting lunch or something else becomes, becomes much more expensive. Are you getting lunch less frequently? Are you changing the way you're doing that? Are you paying for it with a credit 
credit card instead of a debit card? How are you substituting those things? And those choices at the margin actually have substantial consequences. Marsha, this is a really good point. Marsha says she read, I've read that cars have been getting larger for a better product margin. That's true. There is this demand. One of the things, of course, the economists had a discussion about how even on the electric vehicle market, uh, we're looking at, you know, SUVs and electric vehicles and the Cybertruck and other things. Um, and the benefit is ultimately it's, it could be a product margin thing. And ultimately it's a question, you know, of consumer demand without looking at average car prices. Would this contribute to higher car loan debt? That's true. If you look at uh, the way cars are produced, there's certainly a question you could say, well, what do consumers want? We've seen an explosion of in the last, what is that meme that showed that all cars are quickly becoming these like hatchback Toyota RAV4 looking things, regardless of what they are. People are gravitating towards very specific models and that does affect the nature of, of these component costs. Obviously cars say in um, you know, around the United States are regulated in the sense that because of safety standards, they have to include certain things, which makes it hard for us to necessarily import a cheaper version or cheaper model car from India or China or somewhere else um, that would that without those safety standards that adds to those costs, but they come with safety benefits. And to your point, though, without looking at I mean, when you look at car loan debt in itself, you know, there were they were drastically affected by supply chain shortages. Um, silicon ship shortages prevented new cars from being made immediately after the pandemic. That sent used car payments skyrocketing, used car prices skyrocketing, and as a consequence, payment for those things skyrocketing. So you're dealing with a few things, one of which is a still uneven inventory market and used in new cars based on production keeping up with demand and other aspects like that, even though supply chains have more or less been resolved. And the second thing is higher interest rates overall, which are causing these payment structures to accelerate rapidly. It was easy uh, before the pandemic or even at the beginning of the pandemic to get a car loan in a single digit, a very low single digit, like one, two, three percent. And then nowadays uh, for good credit scores, you know, you're going to be paying higher percentages, which is also driving those prices higher. So that's that's a combination of those things. Five trillion in consumer debt there and just dropping the mic right there. Albert says, there we go. Now we can chat with everyone. We're now cooking with gas. Oh, we had it off. If you think car margins are crazy now, wait till cars charge you to turn them on or to use AC. Please insert microtransactions for my car. Riley, you live in the desert. Let's, uh, if we're uh, 20 bucks, you can use AC for this trip. Uh, Aaron says, student loans, uh, revolving credit, auto loans, secondary consumer debt, all combined are 5 trillion. All the payment turns are resetting from seven to 12 to 14 to 25% rates. That's what I'm talking about, Aaron. That's exactly right. Sean says there was the issue of semiconductor shortages which caused news cars to be scarce. So yes, that's right. So people who wanted to upgrade their trucks looked to the used car market and bid up the prices. Bam, exactly right. Exactly what we were talking about a second ago too. Looking at uh, uh, the supply chain shortages, decreasing the amount of new cars being made, leading to more used car demand. And we're still seeing some volatility there. And used car and new car prices are up and down when we look at the inflation numbers. Bam. And Albert says, if you think consumer spending is about to drop like a rock now, it'll be negative when student loans come back online. Yay, roller coaster. Student loans are another interesting variable that will continue to affect the market without having many people, um, uh, you know, if you weren't in a position to be able to afford to pay your student loans, this has been a nice break window for a couple of years. However, October coming around, those payments will be due. And as a consequence, this will have negative effects. And I'm actually very interested in how this affects directly the holiday spending market, which is often very, very expensive to begin with. So often a very, very key indicator of consumer success. Colin, you got stuff. What do you got? Yeah. Um, the way I understand it, it, and you know, this brings it back to banks, is that banks and financial institutions generally treat debt as assets. Mm. At what point would the market start looking at debt as liability? Or is that even a thing? I see what you mean. So the way that we look at banks. So yes, banks operate in this really interesting play where, you know, and I started before I was an academic, I started banking very near and dear to my tiny, crinkled, Scrooge-like finance heart. And so when we think about banks, we think about the way that they lend and looking at this and, you know, it's, it's debt becomes assets and all of these things. At the end of the day, it comes down to a few things. And, and one of those are the expectations and the assessment of risk on those individual loans that banks give. So banks are required to keep uh, an amount of available capital. For instance, um, our they have to maintain the Basel III capital ratios or other equivalent regulatory structure as uh, allowed. Our capital structure at most banks have been relatively 
historically strong post-2008 with some noted exceptions. What that means is banks have a certain amount of capital they derive from things like deposits, and they can't spend all of it on loans. They have to spend up to a certain percentage. And they might be able to spend 80%, 90%, my cold black and heart, Sean says, on things like, uh, uh, on things like loans, but keeping a capital base. So if anything went sour or they had uh, write-offs to these loans and these loans couldn't be paid back, the depositors would be protected and the bank would be in fiscal uh, a series of fiscal strength. What's going to be interesting, though, is the way that banks, so one of two things, there's two things at play. In uh, the most recent uh, senior lending survey that was issued to bankers, bankers were saying that in many cases, and this was back in May, uh, they were going to start to be a little bit more conserv conservative about the way they lent money, uh, in part due to the ramifications of the Silicon Valley bank crisis in March and other situations that the regional banking crisis uh, that we experienced in March, as well as um, some generalized concerns about the, the state of the economy as it regards to consumer credit. Now, bankers have still been lending, though not at the speed that they have. Bank lending is often considered an engine of the economy because, you know, um, for instance, at the, at the margins, we think about how business and other jobs and money is created. Uh, bankers, through an effort of issuing a loan, loaning $5 million to build a hotel or a pizza place or whatever it is locally or you know, um, you know, a nice, you know, uh, 30 foot shack in, in square foot shack in Atherton or whatever it is for 5 million. But you have a situation where you have uh, uh, an amount that the bank lends, the bank decides how risky it is, and then that becomes a cash flow. And that cash flow, of course, can be sold or provided to other banks, and that becomes a promised return. The issue becomes, of course, Ah, Aaron points it out beautifully. Bank capital ratios, equity, and collateral determine risk and rate levels. Aaron, giving you the succinct version of where I'm going. So all of these things is determine and aggregate, you know, how risky a bank is, these individual loans made. When it becomes an issue is when um, banks are dealing with greater than anticipated delinquencies, greater than anticipated loan risk. Um, and that becomes an unaccounted for risk and that can drain some of their capital supply. And that can be reinforced if the bank uh, has a few bad quarters where they did a really good job at risk management, large depositors get nervous, they start taking their money out, then it becomes a cycle where now the bank doesn't have enough capital to lend and they also don't have enough capital to maintain or keep uh, their, current, uh, uh, their current capital ratio sufficient. And so there's a lot of things at play, but it comes down to, as Aaron pointed out, how much bank capital the bank has, the risk of the lending arrangements it has and whether or not there's any surprises to these things. March was a big surprise for a lot of banks. They weren't expecting to uh, end up in a situation where they were badly capitalized. So instead of looking, it's not, it's less about debt assets and more about are these assets paying me back what I promised them and are they at the level of risk that I thought they were? Oh, Aaron points out, oh, construction loans six to 24 months have collapsed. Oh, this is great. I love that. That's okay. a really interesting... <laughs> yeah. Wow. So to kind of bring that back to like yeah. the general public, what happens if the banks collectively realize people, the loans are starting to default? Yeah. Like so you know, it has to happen, right? We're at oh. max credit card loan. The okay. gap's right there. The as far as I can tell, the debt is twice what it was. Right. Right. So that's right. So what happens? And so the debt itself is good. And we're going to look at another couple of numbers down here to make us think about it a little bit more. But uh, uh, Colin, that's a really good question. So what happens is, and this is the fear of this and how it affects the economy in general is banks, when they're nervous about capital, they stop lending. They turn off the spigots for money. And that has a vastly negative consequence to the financial system, because if people can't get loans renewed, they can't build projects, that means they can't hire people, they can't do things. And that's an easy way. And that's really what happened. In two, why 2008 was so terrible is that the bank came out. We had all these banks taking on risky debt. They said, wait a second, it's a lot riskier than we thought it was. We got to stop lending right now. And so they shut it all off. And then the economy collapsed as a consequence of that. And so that becomes the fear and what the Fed or the Treasury is going to be particularly interested in are ways they can help combat those fears as they, array, as they arrive in the market. And right now we're in this weird space. We know, we know all the loans. And this is why I'm, I'm completely flabbergasted at people who are like, we've got a lot of growth ahead. And we do have growth ahead in the future. But right now we have this situation where we're taking on more consumer debt. All the signs are pointing to more consumer stress, not less consumer stress. And that's why I'm looking at this as being like, this is okay for now, but there are some troubles on the horizon. 
Um, and if you want some real estate, there's a ton of cheap commercial real estate. On, oh, we're going to talk about too. Yeah, look at that. You can buy some excellent downtown um, San Francisco real estate looking in there. It's so hard and so expensive uh, uh, to... Uh, I uh, uh, purchase uh, uh, some commercial real estate in parts of the country, but because of the drop off in activity in downtown San Francisco, what a time, what a time to be alive to start your own business. Albert's List, uh, are you guys going to buy a skyscraper? What's going to happen? That was a great time to buy one. <laughs> it could happen. That was a great Right time. across the street. Just right, you know, by the Transamerica Pyramid. Albert's pyramid. That'd be great. One of those things. Twitter building. <laughs> they should they should buy the Twitter building. Elon's top paying rent. That's true. The Millennial Tower. <laughs> That's fun. Oh, I love it. That would be nice. The whole thing. All 645 feet. So going down to this, we got some other things here. A couple things happened in the news. The Albert Force Tower. <laughs> uh, a few things, ratings downgrade. What do I mean by this? Well, the United States. So we know about this, and I wanted to talk about this. I talked about this a little bit, but, but I want to talk about this more with you guys. So Fitch, of course, came out and said, hey, guess what? The U.S. has been downgraded. Why should you care that U.S. debt has been downgraded? Well, as it turns out, um, so one of the things that we evaluate we think about evaluating a company as being creditworthy or not creditworthy. A company like Moody's, S&P, or Fitch will look at a company's balance sheet, determine and saying, hey, you know, they have a lot more debt than anticipated. The rate at which they're acquiring debt is unsustainable. And they'll issue a rating on that. And ratings are important because they determine uh, to a creditor what a fair interest rate might be, per se, for your loan, how creditworthy you are as a company. And the same thing works actually for countries as well. There's a bunch of countries in the United States is, as, as it turns out, a country. And we have the same amount of, uh, uh, of sort of uh, perception of creditworthiness is very important to us. Now, we had a ratings downgrade uh, uh, of U.S. debt, which meant that although we're still, quote unquote, investment grade, uh, Fitch pointed out and said, wait a second, the deal, the issues we had around getting our debt ceiling raised, among other things, mean that we're kind of in a little bit of dire straits with regards to our current market situation and our current availability on um, uh, uh, our, current, uh, our perceived ability to pay our debt. And if we look at this, you know, one of the things we, where your tax money goes to um, is interest payments on debt that we have. When we spend more money in a given year than we have, what happens is the government issues bonds and bonds are owned by you, me, everybody in our 401ks and also companies and also other countries. And um, as those rates go up, uh, for instance, when the interest rates rise, uh, we pay more for our debt in the same way that you would pay more for your mortgage or other credit card debt that you might have. The United States pays more interest payments on their bond payments. So despite the fact we were acquiring more and more debt through the first you know, 20 years, of the, of the 21st century, um, you notice that the average sort of uh, uh, interest payment we were physically paying from the federal government remained relatively consistent. That's because interest rates were dropping. Interest rates bottomed out between this 2008 and 2010 period, 2020 period. And then, of course, with interest rates rising, that means that the amount we have to spend on interest payments, in addition to taking on more debt, also rises. And now it's to the tune of a trillion dollars a year, which is very significant. So it used to be typically we had around five to six percent of our of our budget was geared towards interest payments. This is going to increase, and it'll increase at a level that'll make it harder for us to pay for other things we need to spend money on for our economy, ranging from uh, in our government budget for things like social security, things like um, uh, defense spending, and whatever it is that, that that we want to spend money on. And so this is really interesting. Colin asks, "Are credit ratings still trustworthy in 2008?" So they're trying really hard to be, Colin. Um, and generally speaking, at the end of the day, the same formulas they use, they aren't mystical. Uh, they have data to it, but they are doing an okay job most of the time. And they always do until they mess something up. A lot of credit agencies, you notice this week, you may have read that banks were also being downgraded. Why were banks being downgraded on credit? And commercial real estate is one of those reasons. Commercial real estate, not just looking downtown in a situation where you're rocking and rolling, talking to uh, uh, about your next purchase that you might or might not have in the uh, San Francisco downtown real estate sector, but you're looking at an expansion of commercial real estate debt. Um, so who's holding this debt? 
interestingly, what's changed in the last five years has been instead of a market that was basically 50-50 large banks, small banks, most of commercial real estate debt now, a majority of it is held by small banks. Small banks often lack uh, the depth of liquidity and the ability to handle a large amount of those loans going south. And so it becomes a very difficult and tenuous situation to look at. So Albert says, I would love to be the bank collecting interest on the United States of America. Oh, you can be. Just buy a bond. I mean, you'll be, you, you can, you too can be a bank collecting interest on the United States. But um, also to think about, and I want to kind of shift gears a bit as we talk about the affordability question into the real estate sector. Oh, Colin says, what's stopping the USA from just turning on the money printer again to pay off that debt? Uh, hyperinflation. So a really interesting question. I mean, Colin asked a really interesting question. A lot of people say, oh, we got debt. Do we have to care about debt or not care about debt? And this is always this is always some of it. And that's a really earnest question. And a lot of people always ask and say, well, can't we just print the money? We can't. There's a lot of you know theorists out there saying we can't actually default on debt. OK, so we are actually a country, as you know, a free floating currency country alike to other countries in the world. We're not like especially special. Yes, the dollar is a reserve currency. It's in the interest of no one, particularly us, if we actually default on our debt. But um, one of the things to think about with this is if that actually happened, um, you know, and as a consequence, uh, uh, you know, could we avoid it by just printing our way out of it? And, you know, there are versions of this, there's like the trillion dollar coin thing that Yellen called a gimmick and all these other things that people talk about as ways we can get out of, you know, you know, paying our debt. So the problem is to pay off our debt, we would physically have to pay back those debt holders, which include you, me, everyone else in China. And to the tune of that, that would be to the tune of all of our debt. So we're talking trillions and trillions of dollars. So the last fiscal stimulus of $5 trillion, some of which, you know, uh, we saw the consequences of that. It was nice. It got our economy cranking again, but it also jump-started inflation to the highest level in 40 years. This would require a fiscal stimulus to the tune of about four times that amount. Actually, more than that, about five times that amount. So it would cause, uh, it would be <laughs> a very negative macroeconomic shock in terms of inflation. That money would flow. It would pay off our debt, yes, but it would, it would risk causing a major inflation crisis in the United States. So that's the issue. And then you have our, just imagine what the Fed would set rates to then. Congratulations on your new 87% mortgage. Sean said uh, the regionals also lack uh, risk management function that the majors have. Bam, absolutely right. Hence the banking crisis we recently saw transpire. I agree uh, with you, Sean. I think this makes us vulnerable. Um, to have a lot of small bank CRE debt. And I'm going to go in front of a bunch of bankers and say this. And a lot of them are small bankers going, we can do it. And I'm like, no, you got to listen to me. You got to listen to me. You got, you're limited. Hmm. Look at this. And so look at that. Oh, yeah, you're right. So the M1. <laughs> Colin's going to. Oh, man. So, so, so this is interesting, Colin. So there's a bunch of ways we might look at currency, one of which is uh, demand deposits, liquid deposits, which include savings deposits. We saw a jump of M1 and the chart here that Colin shows in Fred. Um, and M1 is that liquid uh, savings uh, uh, that we had that increased very rapidly in the economy from like $4 trillion to $16 trillion in a very short amount of time, a $12 trillion jump. I'm and, right. I, yeah. I don't know how anyone who understands math cannot look at this and not freak out. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's weird. It's like, why would this cause inflation? I know what is this? How did that not? How would that not cause inflation? <laughs> this is really interesting. And so you have this shift, right? So, so M one, we have all these monetary measures, and this is that this is the nerdy part of the conversation. So, thank you to those of you who remained. I know we lost some people in the last nerd. We got too nerdy real quick. So M one is, um, and thank you guys so much for joining us on this Wednesday evening. I know you're getting home. You're hungry. You're thirsty. You're struggling, you're looking at uh, uh, discounted uh, industrial uh, and uh, uh, commercial real estate in downtown San Francisco, and you're deciding how you can trick the regulators or local city authorities into, into being able to live there, uh, but um, because it might be cheaper. 
M2, on the other hand, and this is what Colin also provides, is the money supply that isn't, so M1 talks about liquid deposits, demand deposits, M2 includes M1, and all there are also other things like savings deposits. So we have a lot broader uh, range here. That's a bit smoother to that point when we include things like savings. It looks like a, just a handy, immediate $3 trillion rise. And then of course, when the Fed increased rates really quickly, one of the things it was looking for was that, will it reduce that, that monetary supply? And we see that. So M1 and M2 both kind of came down in accordance. Oh, good. Uh, Aaron requesting special activity to be let in as he goes to his, his personal computer. Um, and so we have a bunch of ways to measure monetary supply, but I guess the thing is, Colin, to that scale of that, it wouldn't just be, that's a good way to look at this. And, and it would flow through to a level that even, that would dwarf 2020 is what we would have to do to do it. And that might, that would cause some problems for us, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, that's a, oh man, home buying. <laughs> if you're a first time home buyer, is it a good time to be alive? No. Uh, it's the housing affordability is the worst on record, as it turns out. First time home buyers, if we go back all the way back to the 1980s, looking for a mortgage, looking for a combination of low rates, increased asset prices, high rates, typically decrease asset prices. But even though we have mortgage rates that have soared to 7.09% in, in, in the Fred for 30 year, uh, uh, the 30 year Fannie Mae number that we just was released last week. We have um, our affordability has not, um, <laughs> prices have not come down in tandem, which means that affordability has collapsed. And we're actually in an interesting role when we think about this. None of this is surprising. The median selling price of US family homes, new homes are actually now cheaper than existing homes. A lot of new home builders, and to the point of Aaron's earlier construction point, uh, uh, are have to, they've been, they've been, trying to negotiate with sellers to try to get them off the lots. A lot of new homes were initiated. They have trouble selling them because mortgage rates have increased. And as a consequence now, new home prices have collapsed. And nearly one third of for sale homes are actually new construction. A lot of, this is, a lot of that is actually driven by not only just we're having a little, it looks like, oh, is this a really big building boom in this chart? A lot of it is due to the fact that the percentage of existing homes for sale has dropped off so precipitously. And again, even if uh, what we need to see to see prices change is a lot of churn. What makes a market free are a lot of different buyers and a lot of different sellers. So is demand for real estate going to ease up anytime soon? Uh, one way to look at this is you can look at the number of households for household formation. And this is from John Burns, Research and Consulting. We added about 2.1 million households in the last year. Um, that is a very robust rate of household growth. This is a good measure because it predicts demand for real estate. And so this is pushing demand up. And so the question is, what do we do about these supplies and other issues? And we have these conversations over and over again. And one of the things that is particularly unique in the English speaking countries in particular, uh, and this is from the Financial Times, is that if we look at both the total dwelling stock per thousand people uh, of Anglophone countries, as well as uh, the change in real estate house prices, uh, Anglophone countries have done terrible relative to other countries in the world, in particular, other developed European countries in this particular element. So for instance, even though other countries have been doing a better job at building homes and keeping prices low, the United States has not done a particularly good job. And we're right there with a bunch of real troubled real estate areas from Canada, Australia, the UK, Ireland, and New Zealand in our, in our, in our lack of building and affordability. So what can be done, and I say this all the time, and I think it's important to note, but one of the things are is that, of course, housing supply, increased supply, increased supply. In particular, yes, we've seen demand for multifamily units, but a lot of that, the majority of that are rentals. It's hard to build equity with rentals. You need to act, you can't build equity with rentals by definition. You have to end up being in a position where you feel comfortable buying a home or buying something. And that starter home market across the country is lacking in a lot of cities, towns, and places. And so we have to look at questions of density, questions of drastically improving zoning. And any of that has to happen at the state level. It can't happen at the local level. Yes, you can have good creative crafty things, mortgage financing authority equivalents in other states that help people apply for student loans and other things but it will never be a big enough project to influence the demand for everybody. In the town where I live in, uh, our median household income is about 61,000. That means that the average, and the average home price is about you know, 500 to $600,000, $550,000. 
So that means that if you look at the number of homes that an average household can buy, say the $300,000 market, you end up with one or two and they're always like 600 square foot condos. And so this thing is happening across the country, this tendency. And with interest rates so high, it makes it very unaffordable. And, um, and we need to figure out ways we can stimulate the economy through building, considering optimal density arrangements. High horse, Shetland pony. I like, not a low horse. A low horse I like to stand on. So inflation, oh my goodness gracious. How can we not talk about inflation? Inflation, we had such a great run. We were running from June of last year when it was 9.1%, and then it went down to 3% last month. The inflation port comes in and it actually ticks up slightly to 3.2%. Yeah, tisk, tisk, tisk. For the first time in over a year, and this is one fear that the Fed has as well as everyone else, now that we've come this far in inflation, it might be a little sticky. Some months it may go up, some months it may go down, even when the general tendency is improvement. Core inflation, if we take out volatile food and energy, core inflation still dropped to 4.7% from 4.8. That's pretty good. Where did we see those growth, that growth in the last year, year on year in, in the most recent report this month? Motor vehicle insurance up 18%. Motor vehicle maintenance up 13%. You buy that expensive car with the $1,000 payment, now you're going to, God forbid, it breaks down and now you're suddenly in a situation where insurance and maintenance are higher. Frozen fruit is up 12%, food away from home about up 7%. Not all things are increasing in price. Energy in particular, um, gasoline are down significantly over the prior year. Health insurance in general also decreased, which was also an improvement. However, looking at this, a graph from Joseph Politano, an excellent person to follow on Twitter for excellent graphs. Uh, inflation, what are the component parts of inflation? I love the visibility of these charts. I can't beat them. So I'll copy them into this because they're so, they're so great. But core services, core goods, energy, and food. At the beginning of the pandemic, energy, a substantial driver of inflation. Notice that in the last few months, the decreased cost of things like gasoline and other energy, it's become a drag on inflation. It helps reduce inflation. They're negative. Core services, though, have been maintained particularly robust. Food inflation is decreasing. Not that We don't have deflation. The level of inflation is decreasing. Uh, energy inflation is decreasing. And the goods inflation we saw at the supply chain shortages has since basically disappeared. And so we're left with this, this concept here, this idea of core services. And this is really hard to control because it's where a lot of people spend money. They're everything from healthcare to lawyers to business services to haircuts. All of those services will fall in the sector and becomes a very important thing to keep track of. Sean says, Bay Area fuel prices are over $5 per gallon. We haven't had any of that relief. I know, well, it's true. You've got a lot of that and your taxes are a bit higher there. I know it's one of those things. Just take a bunch of a roll of nickels, just throw it in your gas tank, call it a day. You'll be okay. And it's one of those things. No, it'll be fine. It's terrible. It's so It takes such a big chunk out of your budget each year. I drive a terribly fuel inefficient vehicle because I bought it at a time when I lived much closer to work. And then I moved 60 miles away from my work. And now I too am suffering the consequences of my poor decision making. So a rising rent. Let's think about this. Rising rent contributions overall, still a driver of CPI strength. So if I zoom in here, and I'll zoom in a little bit here for the cheap seats here, these are, uh, this is some stuff from the Federal Reserve Bank uh, uh, as watermarked here. But we look at housing rents in general, we look at rent contribution in core CPI, still where most of that number is coming from, it's going to be rents. Travel related stuff is the other chunk in addition to other services. So if we really want to get down into it, it comes down to rents, rents, rents. Core PCE inflation rents have been less of a driver. So two ways to look at this, CPI versus PCE, two different measures of baskets of goods and their increase. Both are informative. CPI is the one we typically quote, PCE, uh, a neglected sibling, but it's still valuable with regards to the nature of what it tells us. In this scenario, PCE looks heavily, leans heavily on other quote unquote services. That's good news for our resident slumlords. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so much dialogue here. So what else we got? What else we got? Oh, do you have children? I have a son. He's nine. He has his first day of fourth grade today. Child care costs are ridiculously absurd. And even though he goes to the fancy pants school for fancy children, 
The cost of childcare in general, so prohibitive for many families, has been increasing without abandon and remain higher than overall inflation rates at around 6%. So if you're sitting there with kids, you're not alone. I totally understand you. So other things to think about. The San Francisco Fed came out with an inflation forecast using two interested models. They have a full model and a limited model. Are you ready for the full model? You're not ready, you can't handle it. I'm gonna give you the limited model. In the limited model, what we have in the San Francisco, I was thinking full Monty, Sean, I wasn't gonna say it, but there it is. Sean just drops it out there. Year over year shelter inflation, looking at shelter inflation as it expands across the country. They expect it to flatline around the uh, second quarter of 2024 in the limited model. Oh, Aaron says, we are now in the suck. He is right. Full model. So if they include their other variables, uh, factors you can look up in their most recent communique about this. It's an interesting paper to read. But in their full model, they actually show by the second quarter meaningful uh, decreases in shelter inflation. So one model says, the inflation is going to level off for shelter and it will kind of remain steady. The other one shows in its full version, figure three, that we should start seeing shelter dragging behind, dragging inflation down. That means to expect lower inflation in the long run, which is promising. But how much it will go down does, even though if it goes down a little bit, it doesn't necessarily make things more affordable without greater macroeconomic inputs. Ah, oh, people are asking about the markets all the time. Ah, oh, the markets have been pretty good. They've been so good. Here's the thing, though. One thing we like to look at, this is uh, the S&P 500's equity risk premium. So in other words, how much extra money do you get for investing in the stock market uh, and taking on that additional risk over just investing in safe assets like bonds? So we actually find that this number is a really, really low number to imply that right now the market looks like an increasingly bad buy because there is so much you can get almost as high a return by buying bonds. So mobile phones, and this is one of those things. I like this chart a lot. I grabbed this and I should have put it somewhere else. It was abandoned in the snow. So I had to have difficulty finding this. But this is one of my favorite San Francisco Bay Area charts. If we compare mobile phones used downtown, now I mean downtown San Francisco, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit more. Uh, that's a nice way to say this. A little bit more economically less invigorating than it used to be, and not merely because Elon Musk moved, but looking at mobile phone use, San Francisco, of course, never nowhere near where it recovered 2019, um, even 2020, 21, 22, 2023, a lot of the ennui, a lot of the commercial real estate, a lot of the other stuff. Uh, phone activity is only 30% of what it used to be, still low in cities across the country, but particularly pronounced in San Francisco. So Aaron says, we will now get, uh, get inflation down as we slide into our nice, neat three-quarter recession. Nice package down. I still think, I'm still, I'm still betting on something like that in the next year. So let's break it down into San Francisco and San Jose. And I know um, I'm trying to keep us on time and I'll have time for questions too about some things that we can go over. So in San Francisco, looking at the, on the, uh, the, the breakdown from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, what's happening, what's going on? And I'll move this around a bit so we can see it. So we noticed that uh, we have some of the July data that came in. We don't have all of the uh, 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 July data for things like the total labor force or unemployment rate. The unemployment rate ticked up in both San Francisco and San Jose um, in uh, the months leading from May to June. Uh, unemployment, the number of unemployed individuals increased 9,000. A lot of the layoffs we expected were coming and would show up later, starting to show up here. And it's very interesting because a lot of the numbers show that, especially when you look at non-farm wages and salaries, we're seeing a pretty steady number. Um, we shot up the number of non-farm workers increased, and then we're about 9,000 9, below June. Where are we seeing those job increases or job losses? Uh, trade and transportation has been a pretty steady sector. It's been up 800 down 800, uh, but things like information, we saw some promise here, and I want to point this out. In aggregate, there are still fewer information employees than where we were last year, post pre-tech uh, 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 tech layoffs. But right now, we're still in a position where 
that appears to be coming back at least meaningfully. Uh, we have 156,000 workers in the San Francisco side of the equation, um, still lagging below last year, but an improvement of 1,400 workers over June. We also have improvement in financial activities, but a decline a little bit that's evened out with professional and business services, as well as education and health services. So overall, it's a net decrease in the number of employed workers, and I should expect gradually stable or increasing unemployment in the Bay Area in coming months. Likewise, we look at this, San Jose, same thing. Same story, greater unemployed, about 4,000 more unemployed individuals in June. In uh, San Jose, Sunnyvale, looking down the situation as we go down the line here, um, we see, again, improvements in sectors like information, which is a good sign, but declines in other sectors like education, health services, leisure and hospitality appears to have been, uh, after some very impressive June results, leveled off significantly in July. So we're going to look at this and basically say it's still a pretty good economy. Things are going okay, but uh, there's a lot of uncertainty ahead. Things to watch out for, tying this all together to make this sense. We've got um, declining and deteriorating consumer finances. Uh, you've got uh, student loans coming back online, greater amounts of debt, greater loans in debt. And until I see a figure that says people are spending down credit card debt, meaning that their wages are eclipsing their expenditures meaningfully to a point where they can pay down that debt, I'm going to forecast continued deterioration in this market. And I don't see compelling reasons, particularly even when the, with a job market as strong as it is. And and looking at some data from new hires that came out that suggests that, hey, people are no longer hiring uh, as aggressively as they were in other things in certain sectors. I've got some, it might result in some things to watch in the next few months. Watch banking in the next few months. Watch credit quality in the next few months. Earnings, beware, not only just the retail earnings that Aaron uh, was talking about earlier, watch other things as well. And also be sure to buy Sean a gallon of gas. Uh, Albert says, uh, when do we get our new first negative jobs report, our first rate cut? You know, the way we're looking in this thing, it could be anywhere from three months to six months. It could be next month if things go sour. I don't think so. I think we're going to be in, I think we're going to see that continued gradual slide. It is wild out there right now. Uh, Colin says, are good job market numbers still indicative of J-POW turning on the heat? Job market numbers at the end of the day, the Fed sees this, they know about it, it's solid. It is. It allows them, he can keep the heat up as long as the job market's strong. The only way you're going to see the Fed decrease rates in the short run is if we see a substantial in decrease leveling off or decrease meaningfully in uh, those job numbers. So that's absolutely right. Albert says, Walmart killed earnings this last time though. That's right, is anyone holding NVIDIA? Holy cow. You're absolutely right. So Walmart earnings are really interesting to follow. It's often a contrary stock because our people, and here's the question, Albert, are people shifting to Walmart because they aren't buying other things is the question. And if we draw a couple of lines in a few months and we see people shifting from buying more expensive retail, shifting to Walmart and other places, that will be very interesting, an interesting tell as to consumer confidence in the market right now. <laughs> what do we got? Questions and shenanigans. That's what I got today. I tried to keep it. I know I ran overtime, and I'm so glad to see you got well, see you guys still hanging on, Aaron and Sean and Marsha and Sabrina and Song, Rachel. Thank you guys for being here. Bowen. Aaron says by January you can buy an NVIDIA GPU as a doorstop. <laughs> God, I love this. You guys, I love these. You guys, your comments are I that's why I'm here. I love it. Are are there any comments on the economic slowdown in China and how that might affect us? Oh, yes. The other aging factor. I like, we always think of ourselves, Colin, that's a great point. We always think of ourselves as living in isolation. Meanwhile, second largest economy in the world, our, uh, our, our, our mutually angry trading partner at one another with relations and whatever, whatever the government plays on the Chinese market. It is a very challenging environment and a recession in the United States is bad for the world. A recession in China is bad for the world in terms of the ability not only to sell products and services, even though we look at different countries being able to insulate themselves in it. Um, bad news uh, uh, for the Chinese economy could spread to other places. And there are a lot of sources. You've got uh, a lot of concerning property market situations happening in China, not only the potential failure uh, stories coming out where you're looking at um, people, uh, uh, you know, you know, uh, looking at um, uh, especially the building and real estate market. Uh, uh, 
troubled for the last few years, but in particular, there's been some really bad uh, bad news about some of the largest players in 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 China coming to a a, a challenging crossroads. You see, sort of a hesitancy, almost uh, perhaps a reticence um, by um, uh, top uh, party leaders or uh, or or Xi Jinping to sort of look at the question of. Uh, do we add stimulus to the Chinese economy? Is it serious enough that we have to avoid a recession in a meaningful way? And so you're looking at a combination of just, I am not certain what they're going to do. A stimulus to the Chinese economy that kept it out of a recession would be good for the world and our exports and their exports and our products. A recession would be bad. And in the sense that we're all connected globally in this market, I'm concerned about the European economies. I'm concerned about the Chinese economy. And I'm concerned about, of course, in the sense that it affects our immediate trading partners uh, even more so, countries, Taiwan, South Korea, other places. I have a conference in Taiwan uh, in October, I'm going to. Uh, let's see, Bowen. Uh, Bowen says, oh, this is a good question. Um, really good stuff. Uh, Albert says, uh, da, 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 da. let me go back up here. Uh, Aaron, good. I'll let Aaron handle the AI bubble. Lots of countries laying brick to counter to America. Man, I mean, that's true. I mean, and that's always a noble thing to issue brick as a counter to America. But the problem is, though, is that counters, that doesn't, <laughs> yes and no, we're all united in an economic system. We all rely on trade with each other to survive. I, I, I'm never a fan of like them versus us sort of situations. Aaron says it helps when the China says what 18, 18 to 26 youth unemployment data, that's to the roof. That was in The Economist uh, as well. Bowen says, uh, is the job market recovering and getting better for tech workers? Yes, in general, it is. Let me put it this way. It's not getting worse for tech workers. And that's a good sign. Now, the tech workers in general, is it a good time to switch? You know, I'm interviewing for tech jobs in the last few months, and it seems like it's been really slowly recovering as I'm getting several recruiters reaching out to me recently, but none earlier this year. So Bowen, that's a very good, that is the perfect anecdotal experience of what's been happening in tech. So because of failures like the Silicon Valley Bank in March, other things, general concern about the layoffs we had at the beginning of the year in tech, this has since more or less subsided. You have uh, a growth and excitement about the AI industry that has tempered these effects. There are some concerns though in the long run. Obviously, when you enter, when you switch enthusiasm from a uh, economy that is based off of the perception of risk in the old paradigm, you know, uh, pre-Silicon Valley Bank, this is what's important to an AI area where a lot of people are making speculative investments on the question of AI. Some of those will pay off, some of those won't pay off. And so you might see some, some backslash to this in a couple of years, depending on the nature of those investments. But it will be, I think, enough to, to charge back uh, uh, the tech economy a little bit, especially in the next um, uh, next year or so, let's say. Uh, Colin says, wasn't it a 25% unemployment rate? Then they conveniently stopped publishing that data. They're right. That's right. Sorry. Don't look at this anymore. Ah, I know. Aaron, uh, China debt is 51 trillion as a percent of GDP, two times US ratio. They look like 89 Japan. Aaron's not uh, alone in saying this. One of the worries is not only demographically, but one, one of the ish primary issues in looking at uh, you know, a country as big and vast and as, as powerful as China is looking at questions involving you know, how does uh, growing so rapidly, but also demographically getting older so rapidly and also the situation taking on debt more rapidly. Uh, and, and as a consequence, it's a very unhealthy combination. Um, uh, Albert says, I've been binging Peter's eye. Oh, that's fun. Let's check out good YouTube link. Uh, Sean says, if an economic down slowdown happens in a meaningful way for China, it might increase the risk of them engaging Taiwan militarily. That is a risk. I think that is actually a very strong risk in many ways because um, uh, 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 it's easy, you know, um, behavioral finance. We know that when we're doing well in the economy, we know that risk-taking can be predictive, it's fair, but we know that um, in an example, you know, and using the markets as an example, when uh, we have receive a $1 gain, we're moderately happy. When we have a $1 loss, we're significantly more sad. And how much so? About twice as much, even though it's the same physical dollar value. When stuff starts going down, uh, people in general become greater risk takers. 
Uh, so one of the reasons that we see when markets fluctuate, markets start going down, you see much more of a roller coaster. You see investors getting very nervous and doing those things. Uh, the same argument can be made politically. This is an artifact of being human, right? And the same would happen in the US or China or other governments that when stuff is going downhill or looking bad from one sector, we tend to take more risks in other sectors. And so it'd be very interesting that play geopolitically as it regards China in those respects. Aaron, uh, BRICS plus nobody wants to know their currencies. Do you want to know some others? Yeah, that's right. The hard part is all the BRICS currencies. That's very interesting. You're right. Rubles, rupees. That's, right. that's, that's fascinating. Uh, reals or reals. Um, and uh, very, very fun observation, Aaron. I like that. And my name starts with R. So obviously the same thing. I am a BRIC. Uh, so Colin. Oh, yeah, that's right. Colin getting back to um, uh, Bowen on this as well. Yeah, just a quick point of view is just I think tech will always exist in some shape or form but what is considered tech will always be a moving target because back in the day blacksmithing was tech back in the day cars were tech when Henry Ford was in re reinventing uh how that worked and uh you know programming was tech for the largely for the last 30 years <laughs> AI is now the tech right and you know as things change so do the needs of the market and so do the needs of companies and so changes what they're looking for do we have companies looking for people who code in specific languages versus machine language learner like you know they're looking for something different and they're and this will always exist because it has the highest multiplier that I know of for investors. And that's exactly what they're looking for. And so that's exactly what they're going to invest in. Uh, that, you know, COBOL, yes. <laughs> but that's because COBOL came around at a time before <laughs> um, they were thinking about future proofing any of it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a lot more future proofing in the programming industry now. Um, and, you know, one of the things I kind of look forward is uh, when general purpose AI does come around, which, you know, conservatively 2050, but some people think uh, 20, it'll be as early as 2030, um, that will change the entire game to me. Uh, and we could have a whole seminar on why it would change everything. Uh, but the long story short that I believe is it will change, I think the human economic system will need to change to adapt to AI. It it will it will be a huge reckoning. It's just what I my thoughts. I love it. I love common I love anybody I love any uh, uh business oriented language, uh Marcia. So that's very well done. Um I love this. Good points, Colin, across the board. I love the the philosophy behind this, even going back to the tech is tech and looking at this and in that same spirit, I took a blacksmithing class two weeks ago, so I was very pleased at this. So I feel like <laughs> I feel like I'm ready uh, uh, for 12th century tech now. Um, Evergrande, this is we have to. I want us to do. We have, should actually do this. My proposal is to, based on this information here, especially especially this chat window. Let me do a deep dive into the Chinese economy as a benefit of this because it's such a big. It is a fundamental thing to understand and and, and talk about in our next. Um, next month, perhaps. Uh, maybe that's a good topic that we can discuss to actually go to depth about it. Maybe we'll know a little bit more information depending on, on the way that the recapitalization is going. Try to bring some sources around, bring some China-specific questions. It'll be a great chat, so we'll make it relevant. COBOL on cloud. <laughs> I need to check this out. <laughs> oh my god, everybody's... COBOL cloud. Oh god, this is the moral. This is what we're all doing now. <laughs> Thanks, Marcia. We're all doing it. Everyone's, everyone's going to be coding in this. I have executive MBA students this semester. I'm going to just speak only in, in Kobo language. We'll just do it. All their assignments have to be submitted this way. 64-year-old <laughs> programming languages can't go wrong. I, it's beautiful. Of course not. Kobo <laughs> <sighs> You know, if you're uh, well, you have a very cushy series of jobs, <laughs> one of the most sought after. You like, know, you're already, I mean, if you know it all, that thoroughly, I know you're already a mid-level executive at the Rand Corporation. It doesn't matter. That's where you ended up. You got, it's good. That's it. This yeah. is low for you. You got a great pension. This is great. You've got a, you got a flagon of liquor under your desk. That's the person who runs, who does COBOL. This is great. It's like this. It's an old steel desk from the 1960s. I love it. 
Ah, oh, great. Any questions? Anyone else? Anything else? Aaron, great points, by the way. Um, uh, question in your view, what is the difference between the regular MBA programs and the EMBA programs? <laughs> I mean, if one were to decide which to pursue, how would you guide them? Okay, that's a great question. Do you want the real talk? All right, or like the associate dean of a AACSB research one business school talk. Uh, okay, so real talk, fair enough. I anticipated that. Uh, MBAs are cheaper than executive MBAs. MBAs may come in part-time flavors. They might be full-time or cohort-based. EMBAs, executive MBAs are geared, they're just, they're taught differently. They're taught with other executives and they're also come with a higher price tag associated with them. A lot of business schools use EMBA programs as a profit center for them. The good news is you're with a bunch of high caliber people also paying for a premium business school product. The downside is, uh, is that you'll be paying a lot more money for really if you look, if you're into the, it depends what you're looking for. If you're looking for networking connections with other, uh, uh, networking is fundamentally important in any business program. But an EMBA program is more like, um, you know, networking other executives, team building in a certain respect, and also it's more expensive. MBAs are, um, are, are can offer many of the same things for a cheaper cost. A uh, big thing to look for, distinguishing factor, not merely biased because it's our accreditation body, AECSB accredited business schools, which are most of the big ones. Um, uh, they are the uh, gold standard in business accreditation, and that'll make sure regardless of which program you take, you'll end up in a strong position. Bowen says, do you guys see there's a recession coming soon or are we already in one? We're not already in one, Bowen. That's a really good question. A lot of people think even a majority of Americans or a slight, a slight minority of Americans believe we're already in a recession. We have a strong job market and we've got high, a very low unemployment rate. That is that does not a recession make and also positive GDP growth. There's not actually a metric by which we are actually in a recession. So, but with one coming is a different question. A recession like winter is always coming, but at the same time, we don't know yet if it will be bad, if it'll happen next year or two years from now. I, I'm gonna take the stand that we're still in some risk. How the next six months depend on consumer volatility, looking at consumer spending. If consumer spending takes a dive and given certain risks of the banking crisis, I still think a recession is more likely than not in the next two years. Um, companies have different interpretations of different hiring strategies against their view of the economic situation. Credit card debt's an all-time high, and you've showed previously that housing affordability is low. Albert says, how does your MBA kids feeling about the job market? You know, they feel pretty good, but also they're also wary because they feel good, and then they have my class, and they're like, eh, things could go bad. I like induce realism in them, and then they become, you know, economically rational. Convince us that your pedagogy is more supreme than the others. It's great. I teach people, and because I wave my arms enough, uh, I don't know, <laughs> they get better jobs. Aaron says, as a hard pipe hitter who has taken many company paid MBA courses, it's great revenue stuffing. It is such great revenue stuffing for universities, Aaron. I could tell you a lot about that. Uh, seriously, EMBA courses in your work focus on area can be great. Pricing course, product management, GTM partnering courses can be awesome as you work out real world problems. That is the key. Application, application, application. The name of the game for every EMBA program and hopefully MBA programs is how does it relevant to you in your career pathway? And, and that changes. And that's the thing as well. So I'm happy to talk about this. I'm innately attached to the programs because I was part of building them and also part of a team that manages them. So if you've got higher education questions, let me know. That's fine too. I'm now in my third year as a bureaucrat. So as a low level college manager with 3,400 students and 150 delightful and wonderful faculty that I appreciate. Anybody else, any questions? Oh, good questions. Do you think consulting firms putting junior consultants on the bench is also the indicator? I do. I read about this too, Albert. The idea that these junior consultants are no longer there. I think consultants firms are, I, can't, I think it's, it's revealed preference. Uh, consulting firms are showing that they're concerned about market conditions and they're concerned about somebody messing up at their bottom line. And so by putting, by benching junior consultants, not giving them the authorities, not throwing them into it, they're showing that, hey, we got to handle this before it gets worse sort of situation. I do view that as, as a sign that it's an indicator that something is, is, is on the up and up. 
Um, and I think there's some extra caution injected in the marketplace. I know there's some concern overall. And I think we're going to see more of this kind of stuff in the next year rather than less. Like, I still look at all these numbers. And at the end of the day, you think, hey, this is the evidence to show that we're going to be entering a more tenuous area is, is greater than, 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 than uh, the evidence to show that we're going to be in a better situation in the next six months. So, but it still could be positive. It could be lower and positive. We could have, maybe we can still have a soft landing and avoid a recession. Who knows? Ah, oh, look, Aaron's got some hardcore advice here. Training mode, stop buying, stop buying drinks and study and pile up certificates. I have odds of a soft landing. Albert, I still think I'm, 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 a, I'm a fair coin toss on that. I still think we can pull it if the Fed's expansive and we can avoid it. But the hard part is, I don't know, actually, 40-60, 40% soft, 60%, 40, I'd say 40% soft, 50% uh, recession light, 10% more severe recession. Landing on a mountain of bodies is soft. j Powell, that's pretty good, Colin. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I actually have... Um, office hours after this, in fact. So I have a bunch of students coming into my digital space. So I got to go at 7.30. All I right, then. 6.30 your time. 7.30 my time. <laughs> Alex wants to join office hours, but I feel like that would be up to Dr. White. Sure, rock and roll, Albert. You can rock and roll. Well, whatever, just do it. Just come in here. I'm going to give a lecture on problems you don't have access and materials to, and then you can learn about things like net present value which will be great. Thank you, Sabrina. I appreciate you being here. And this is an honor to be here. We're so happy you're here. This webinar is, this is bigger than office hours. You get to, <laughs> uh, it's been a stressful week. I get to do it, but it's so grateful that you all made it. I appreciate you spending the time with us, Colin and Albert. Um, Colin's sensible commentary, my arm waving and nonsense, but I appreciate you both. All, all right, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. We hope that you feel more informed so you can make better decisions and better decisions always come from being informed, right? Um, this was recorded, will be put on YouTube within seven days and we hope you join us next time.